Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello there. Welcome to the midweek supplemental episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's episode number 97. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to, as I said, episode number 97, and that means, Bob, number 100 is not far away. We're getting up there. We are getting up there. Kind of a milestone in the podcasting field. My math is correct. We're three away, or two (laughs) after this one. I'm going to have to trust you on that, man. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, folks. (laughs) 724-466-4487. We appreciate your uh, calls and your comments and your questions. This is the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn all about knives and knife collecting. As we alluded to, it is our midweek supplemental show where we get to uh, talk more in depth about knives. Some of the new knife drops that are out, Bob talks about uh, his collection, kind of focusing on certain knives. Uh, Occasionally, we'll have special segments like uh, Maintenance Minute, Tip of the Week, uh, the First Tool segment. Uh, None of those today. We've got a full section of Knife Life news we're going to get into, as well as uh, State of the Collection. Bob's going to be talking a little bit about his new Emerson Iron Dragon and also uh, something involving the CQC7. So we'll have to just tease that and see what's what's up with that. But, Bob, first we want to address something, uh, you know, kind of serious, uh, still ongoing with the COVID-19 coronavirus situation. Just hope everybody that's listening is staying safe. If you're, uh, you know, being asked to stay at home, well, everybody's being asked to stay at home. Certain locales or businesses are actually shut down, and you're, you're, you really can't go out. Uh, stay safe, everybody. That's yeah. what we're concerned about. Well, take it seriously. You know, I'm sure most people are, but, uh, you know, just take it seriously and then this can be over quicker. Yeah. I happened to uh, hear this past weekend here in our local area of a gathering of close to 500 people that were at a local winery. And I was like, why? Oh, how precious. Yeah. And it wasn't it wasn't an organized event. It was just a nice day. And I guess. 500 people decided to go to the local winery. But, you know, you got to think about these things, people. You know, we're being asked to avoid community spread. Keep yourself and and your family and people you don't know safe. You know, yeah. just just do what's being asked of you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure I'm sure we're preaching to the choir, you know, when we say don't be selfish and don't be, you know, don't be impulsive and ridiculous like that. Uh, I'm sure most of the people who are listening to this, <laughs> I'm probably sure everyone uh, we're preaching to the the choir, so I know you're all doing the right thing, but it's it's kind of a bummer to hear when you know everyone's everyone's trying to do their thing, and then everyone's trying to do their part, and then people are then a few knuckleheads don't <laughs> are out at the right. winery <laughs> and, getting cracked, ruin it for all of us. Yeah. All right, as we said, we got a lot of stuff that Bob wants to get into with Knife Life News, but first I want to remind you, mention the listener line up front, but again, that number is 724-466-4487, 724-466-4487. If you have a question or comment, we'd love to hear from you. We'd also love to uh, play it on an upcoming episode of the podcast, so if you have anything you'd like uh, for Bob to discuss or uh, a topic or whatever, just call the listener line and let us know. Uh, Jim, before we get into life knife news, I, I just wanted to uh, I, I wanted to bring up an observation uh, with you and with our listeners, and observe and see, away, yeah, and see if there's any uh, if I can get any corroboration on this. Uh, I have noticed that with each new knife I get, a new callus develops or a new callus is required. It sounds funny, unless it's something like a, a wee knife or something that is just so uh, civilized that it doesn't require a new. Okay. Uh, what I'm getting at is this. I got my new Medford, which I've been talking about a lot recently mm-hmm. from Alex, the Slim Midi. And it is a, a really rock solid. I mean, it is a, a really rock solid knife, but it is thin. It it reminds me of the Spidey Chef in its dimensions. Uh, so it is a thin titanium, thinner. It's not it's not huge and bulky like a normal Medford or like your uh, average Medford. And uh, so when you go to unlock the lock bar, which doesn't... Uh, which which isn't given a uh, relief cut for easy access. So you, you kind of have to dig your finger in between the two scales. And the scale is thin, and there's a little bit of uh, channeling in there, which makes it even thinner. So it was becoming painful on the thumb. And I, I hate to sound like a... A like, a, like a soy boy. Yeah, a wuss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, like, I can't, it hurts when I close my knife. But, um, you know, so I was 
you know, using alternate methods, my other hand or my, my forefinger. And, and then I decided, Bob, uh, this is a lesson you've learned before. Suck it up. Just get your thumb in there and develop that new callus. And now, a week later of playing with this thing and thumbing the lock, sorry for saying that, but uh, it, the callus has developed. And now it feels like a, a, a normal knife. Now it feels like I'm disengaging some sort of highly civilized knife rather than this high speed, low drag, you know, manly man tool here. And then the other the other knife I got recently, the Iron Dragon. Well, ho- ho- hold on. I want to I want to let our mm-hmm. knife maker friends know that from now on, <laughs> if you make knives that Bob is going to buy, please consider his gentle hands <laughs> so that he doesn't hurt himself when he opens your knives. I, I would say on the contrary, please make them painful <laughs> like this because it's making me more of a man, a better man, a stronger man, <laughs> manly man. I can't believe you just dissed my my girly hands right here on the air. No comment. <laughs> Continue <laughs> right. on. I guess I said it. Okay, so uh, I also got this Iron Dragon uh, from Alex, and it's uh, it's this awesome um, uh, Emerson knife. But he had a, a precision gray thumb disc on it, and uh, it is this beautifully uh, machined and uh, uh, sort of gear patterned uh, thumb disc. It, it's a bigger than the ordinary uh, Emerson thumb, thumb disc and just it just cool looking beautifully machined it's thin on the side and at first i was like oh this this is like a little saw blade this is like a little circular saw blade and then i realized no bob you just have to develop the callus and uh, so in opening this and closing this a billion times over the last uh, say 4 or 5 days since i've had it uh, that callus has developed i am a stronger man and a better knife owner and uh, so I, I want to thank you all for putting me through that. So these two knives and these two new calluses, are they in different locations? No, it's it's just turned my thumb into one. One giant callus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. I, I thought it already was, but, but these two knives have touched parts of my thumb I didn't know existed. Well, let me ask you a knife newbie question. You said a uh, thumb stud. Um, could you explain uh, that? Oh, I said a thumb disc, actually. Thumb, thumb disc. Thumb disc. My so uh, the um, Emerson knives and many others use, instead of a stud that goes through the blade uh, and allows you to open it with your thumb, places a flat disc on the top of the blade, uh, allowing you ambidextrous access to one-handed opening because the uh, the disc spans across the spine and gives you kind of a half circle on both sides for your thumb to reach and, uh, you know, cam it open. Okay. So it's more than just an aesthetic feature. Oh, yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't think it really has uh, it, this one in particular, this uh, Gray's Precision one has aesthetic value. They they took something that was totally utilitarian and turned it into, you know, a little flourish thing. OK. Yeah. All right. So can be both. Yeah, it can be both. Exactly. And is now. All right. Well, we'll give Bob a moment to uh, soak his thumb before we get into Knife Life news. But I do want to remind you that if you'd like to support the Knife Junkie podcast as you're doing your online shopping during this uh, coronavirus situation, trying to stay out of physical stores and that kind of thing, we would love for you to use our affiliate links, let you know up front. We do get a very small commission if you uh, shop on Amazon for any of your uh, needs. Go to the knifejunkie.com slash shop Amazon. We get a very small commission, help support the show, but it does not increase the price that you pay for your merchandise. Just uh, is a nice way to say thanks to Bob and Jim for the Knife Junkie podcast. So the knifejunkie.com slash shop Amazon. Wiki, 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 Knife Life News. You can bring it in. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Famed French knife maker Tashi Barucha who is known for his incredible designs, elegant, beautiful designs, and small batch uh, custom knives, is teaming up or has teamed up with Vincenzo Fiore, uh, someone I hadn't heard of until now, but he's an Italian ballet song maker who's known for his super high-tech uh, engineering uh, capabilities. So they teamed up to make a ballet song called The Logan, and as you may know from following Tashi on Instagram over the past couple of years, uh, he likes Logan, uh, uh, Wolverine from the X-Men. And who doesn't? Who? OK, who who is listening to this podcast right now doesn't have at least a soft spot in their heart for Wolverine, if not have 
him be their favorite superhero. I'm not much of a superhero guy, but I mean, come on, Wolverine. Anyway, uh, a couple of years ago, Tashi made a uh, a set of Wolverine claws, a few of them. Uh, so each set included six incredibly uh, crafted Wolverine blades set in a handle, much like a push dagger, that when you grip them, the blades came out uh, kind of protruded from your knuckles and it looked like you were Wolverine, basically. I mean, so cool. Anyway, so he's teamed up with Vincenzo Fiore to, to make a single bladed Bally song version of this. And uh, it is gorgeous. The blade is uh, has a, a gentle sort of hawkbill shape with a harpoon swedge on the top. And it is almost five inches long, which is pretty sweet and it so which is going to make it really big when you're flipping it around i know bally songs tend to be in the in the four plus inch range uh but five inches is pretty big it's rwl 34 and uh, the two handle sides are integral titanium so the thing is really light and it's pinless and i don't even quite understand what that means but uh but uh, vincenzo fiore is known for making pinless uh bally songs so uh this thing is only four and a half uh, ounces it's clipless and latchless which means you have to kind of carry it in a pouch it's not it's not to free float in your pocket and yeah this thing is going for 1500 bucks if you can get your hands on it uh, oh sign me up for a couple yeah. then. <laughs> the first one was auctioned off you want two or three i'll like yeah okay <laughs> at that price absolutely <laughs> uh so yeah these are sarcastic obviously... <laughs> folks in case you didn't know these are very special one-offs. I mean, they're going to make a number of them, I guess, but they're they're making them one at a time, and they're they're just astoundingly beautiful. Now, Tashi Barucha to me is one of those guys whose work, though, it doesn't get too complex with the patterns. It doesn't get all Mister Furley with all the different crazy materials, but his work is artful in 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 their very designs, in their lines, and in their drafting. That I think they're just beautiful knives. So uh, to have this Bally song would be something. Uh, knife newbie question. I, I have heard the term Bally song for a while now, you know, yep. being with you on the podcast. What exactly is a, a Bally song? Uh, they're also known as butterfly knives. These knives that have two equally sized handles uh, that split open, revealing the blade on the inside. And then there are there's a whole subset of the knife culture. There's a whole subset subset of the knife culture called well i don't know fl flipper boys or flipper i don't know people who like to flip these and they do outrageous tricks flipping these things around throwing them up gotcha. spinning around yeah it's pretty crazy okay well as we uh, continue on with the knife life news section uh several stories upcoming bob we're not getting the the same old knife companies that we're talking about we've got uh protect gerber uh, something about tor uh, tortoise gear we're going to talk about for a sack and uh, K bar. So we've got some some newbies in the in the lineup this week. So uh, starting off uh, or second up, I guess, is uh, something with Protech. Yeah, yeah, Protech, uh, storied uh, switchblade makers, uh, automatic uh, knife makers from California. They're the best. I love them. They've been around for a long time. They just came back out with their Harkins ATAC Dual Action Auto. Uh, J.A. Harkins is a, a legendary custom knife maker, and um, it in the 90s, I believe, he came out with the ATAC, which is uh, uh, in the knife world, kind of one of those uh, uh, older um, storied collectible blades, basically. I use that word storied twice in this piece. I'm going to stop right there. And uh, so this knife is very complicated to make, so they only come out with it every couple of years. They'll make a small batch of it. Uh, but it's a uh, it's a dual action automatic, and I have a dual action automatic that I've talked about on this show. And uh, it you move the bolster, and the blade pops out automatically, or you can thumb it open, slow roll it out with the thumb stud. Uh, this one uh, allows you to uh, you push on the thumb disc. This knife has a thumb disc, and it will automatically deploy, kind of like a um, assisted open. Or you can squeeze a special part of the bolster. And the blade will fly out switchblade style. Uh, this thing has got a very, very simple neutral handle and a very simple and kind of neutral drop point blade, long and slender. Well, long and slender in proportion. It's only 3.25 inches long. And it's 154 cm, a classic uh, Protex steel. That's what they use most of the time. And this thing is just 
kind of cool in its in its um sort of historical reach back to early tactical folder blade uh, folding knives. It's aluminum with carbon fiber inserts, and uh, you know they'll only be making a, a small release of this, and then they'll be gone for a while because they're a pain in the ass to make apparently. Mm-hmm. So limited run, pain in the ass to make equals many dollars. Yeah, many dollars, and but a classic uh, sort of style to bring back. Not style, yeah. a classic model to bring back. Gotcha. So speaking of, um, well, we didn't speak of custom, but <laughs> <laughs> speaking of special, limited run, custom kind of things, yeah. uh, Gerber Knives uh, has a custom shop for a few of their models. Not Not all of them, but a few of them. Yeah, yeah, this is part, I think, of their sort of rebirth. They've been the last two years or so with the um, with the advent of the fastball uh, and the strong arm, uh, the strong arm, a fixed blade that came out to much acclaim. A lot of people reviewed and loved it and still do. And the fastball, a knife they came out with last year, a, a ball bearing flipper, uh, worn cliff blade, cool looking knife. I've never uh, I've never held one myself. Uh, but they've been retooling the works. They've uh, they went through a, a dark period where they were sort of rejected by knife people and more embraced by uh, casual knife users. Maybe the the person who's going camping with his family and picks up a knife at Target, those kind of users. And and I am so happy that they have been working their way back into the hearts of knife lovers because when I was growing up in the seventies, uh, when I was a little kid. My dad had a uh, lockback that was sort of, uh, you would put it on the same shelf with the uh, Buck 110, but it was more stylish. It was thinner and and just really cool. And it, it came in a uh, leather sheath. My dad kept it in his den. And uh, that knife to me, and it said legendary blades on it, on the uh, sheath. And, and that had, <laughs> that worked its way into my psyche. I always loved that knife. And Gerber was an awesome company at that time. Uh, making the the Mark II dagger, which was also really cool, uh, and then they went through this time where they, eh, I don't know, they just kind of weren't weren't uh, speaking to knife ma- uh, knife lovers like myself, and and now they are again, and I think that's a great thing. So anyway, this this new custom shop allows you to personalize four of their different models: the fastball, the shark belly, the US one, and the strong arm. Uh, here, here's a statement from their uh, creative director, Todd Bischoff. He says, Gerber Custom empowers users to take part in the creative pr- uh, creation process, pairing the precise engineering and reliability, uh, I'm sorry, reliable quality of our best-selling knives with a unique aesthetic. Uh, so basically, you can, you can color the hardware, you can color the G10 in, in some cases, uh, you can uh, mess with the coatings. And uh, you can do different laser engravings. And to me, I think this is a a great idea. It's it's sort of in line with the with the Benchmade Custom Shop, where you can order. Um, I'm not sure if you can order all of their models, but you can pop uh, you can um, customize many of their popular models. And I think that's just a great idea because the more attached you get to a tool, uh, the more you're going to keep coming back uh, when you need a new one to that company. So I think right. this is a smart idea. Yeah, well, instead of, you know, having to buy the one knife they make and then find, I don't know, what, aftermarket accessories or other products to, like I said, change the color, do this, whatever, just hmm. go ahead and make it like you want it right off the bat. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's I didn't even think of it that way. But, yeah, you're totally right because it's – you when you get a knife that resonates with you and you want to make it yours, it it's, can sometimes be hard to find someone who makes a, for instance, fastball aftermarket micarta scale. So mm. if you can just go to the Gerber site and get it there, that's, you know, that's great. All the more power to, to everyone involved. And, and, and by the way, the, the picture I've seen of, the, uh, of, of a customized fastball looks really cool, actually. Looks mm. very cool. So Okay. Got to check that one out. All right. Next up, then, Knife Life News. What do you got for us? I want to talk about two new K-bars. Uh, they're riffs on classic blades uh, they came out recently with the extreme uh, d2 and it's a it, instead of using 1095 crovan they took their classic k bar and started making it out of d2 they gave it a polymer handle but still with that fluting that classic fluting that goes around uh, but they also changed the uh, butt cap and the 
uh, guard. The guard is now a single uh, quillion, and it's pretty small, but it's more substantial and hev- heavily sculpted, uh, or, or more sculpted than, say, the classic K-bar, which is just a stamped piece of steel that's that sits perpendicular to the blade. Uh, this is more integral. And same with the butt cap, which is which flares out down towards your pinky, which a allows it to stay in your hand uh, during a during a robust swing a little bit better, adds, uh, acts like a bird's beak, but also increases the surface area of that butt cap so you can use it as a as a hammer in the field. So um, they came out with the D2 Extreme, but <laughs> each model, I mean, each one of them uh, was partially serrated, and that stuck in the craw of many a K-Bar lover. You know, a lot of people just don't want to deal with serrations, especially on larger fixed blades that they might be using in camp. And you want to use that sweet spot close to the close to the guard to do, you know, as they say, close in work, uh, you know, when you're carving or whatever, you don't want to deal with serrations there. So they listened. And uh, I love this. I love when companies are nimble like this. They listened. They came out with their K-Bar straight edge. So it's the D2 Extreme with just a straight edge blade. And, uh, you know, it looks like a great, it's a seven inch blade. It's their usual sort of uh, uh, K-Bar clip point profile. Uh, But now you can get it. It's a little bit thicker too. And it's uh, 12 ounces, so under a pound. That's cool. Big fan of K-Bars. Let's see. Oh, the other, the TDI Investigator. So I have one of these TDI knives. It's a pistol grip shaped uh, fixed blade. It's a small fixed blade originally intended for uh, carry by law enforcement. And the idea is law enforcement does not drill with regular knives, but they do drill with their guns a lot. So you make the knife shaped a little bit more like a gun, it'll be more instinctual uh, for use. And the idea was you put this next to your gun and or uh, on the opposite side of your gun, and then if someone is trying to get your gun, you can draw that knife and and use it to, to save your life. Well, anyway, they came out with a new one uh, that's just smaller. And I have to say, I think that's a, a welcome addition. It still has the same uh, two and a half inch uh, drop point blade, but uh, the handle is just smaller. Instead of uh, a, a full four-finger grip, this is looking like a three-and-a-half or three-finger grip, but the kind uh, that, that fills up your palm because it's sort of teardrop-shaped. Right. Um, to me, I think carrying fixed blades, the smaller the handle, the better for me. And the more the more blade you can pack, the smaller the <laughs> handle. <laughs> right. So uh, I think this was a good move. I keep a TDI. Um, this I keep the the older version of this knife in one of my uh, in one of my gun safes, right next to my pistol. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Incidentally, okay. I just think it's cool. <laughs> right, all right. Wrapping up uh, knife life news. Uh, something with tortoise wow. gear. Something I haven't. I'm not familiar with. I am totally unfamiliar with them too. Uh, they are known in the Swiss Army knife world in the sack world, Swiss Army knife world, for, the, let's see, they came out with a Firefly toothpick fire starter. You know you know how your uh, Swiss Army knife, you carry the tinker, I think. You know how it has a, the toothpick? I know, I know you know because I've seen you use it after our Chinese lunches. The best feature there is. I, I agree. Well, this company, Tortoise Gear, had created in the past a um, fire starter that fits in that slot. Oh, well, okay. now, so that you don't have to get rid of your beloved toothpick, but you still want a fire starter, yeah. uh, they have made one that very cleverly screws into the uh, wine, the wine, huh, that's the cork, the corkscrew. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And screws it screws into in the there. corkscrew. <laughs> it screws into the corkscrew. Now, I've seen really small um, micro screwdrivers that that fit in that same spot. And so it's a great spot, a uh, great little bit of empty space to fill on a Swiss Army knife uh, because, you know, you're all about maximizing the tool set in a small space. But uh, so this is a fire starter that fits there. And I just think it's brilliant. So I just wanted to wanted to mention that. <laughs> well, now you can uh, start your fire, cook your meat and pick your teeth. all yeah, with one And then tool. open your wine and wash it all down. There you go. I love it. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. All right, back on episode number 97 of the Knife Junkie podcast. A lot of news there, but uh, good stuff, Bob. As Again, as I said, uh, some some different companies that uh, you have a chance to talk about instead of uh, the same ones all the time. Not that we have anything against the same ones we talk about, but 
you know, we can't control the news and what's coming out, but a good recap of some of the news in uh, in the knife world to talk about. Uh, Now, kind of moving on to, as we call it, the state of the collection, give you a chance Mm to uh, talk about some of your knives and uh, things. Uh, We did a lot of talking about your your poor little hands with your... uh, (laughs) <laughs> your, your new knives, but uh, you wanted to talk uh, some more about, uh, I think, uh, something with the, the CQC7 first. You want to kind of kind of get into it? Yeah, well, th- well the, the, the segue with the new knife is actually this. Uh, the, so the CQC7 is an Emerson, classic Emerson. And uh, it is one of the knives uh, in the Emerson lineup that you can get in both uh, phosphor bronze washers at the pivot or... Um, ball bearings at the pivot in in the in a, in the flipper version, and I am starting to wonder now that I've gotten this the Iron Dragon, which is a ball bearing flipper, or it's not a flipper, but it's a ball bearing pivot on a um, Emerson, which is unusual. It's it's a mixture of pure joy to use and uh, well, pure joy to use. My question is though. In an Emerson, which is a hard use knife, you know, and this is what we talked about when when he was on the show, um, is the presence of ball bearings an issue, a problem? Because I can I can hold this up to the light and look through the pivot, and I can see the different ball bearings in there, which means that if I can see them, dust can see them, and grit can see them. And I'm wondering, in a hard use knife, what is more robust? Is it the phosphor bronze washers or is it these uh, these bearings? I think I know the answer, but what I would like to do is get a CQC7 in in both with both um, pivots and then put them through just a sort of average torture test in the woods. Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, nothing nothing too egregious, but, you know, pounding them into wood and and putting them in the stream and and kind of kind of accelerating the hard use of both knives and then see how they come out at the end see if there's any issue with opening the blade or or any difference in opening the blade between the one with the bearings and the one without uh right. i think it would be a useful project just and a fun project it's something i want to know um mm-hmm. and uh so i'm thinking maybe uh, i i've had this patreon account for ages that i've never activated and I'm thinking maybe I'll start activating, you know, start working on that, get it activated so I can hmm. get some, maybe get some fundage to buy a CQC7, uh, two, two different kinds, uh, hmm. you know, down the, down the way. I'm not saying that would happen right away. Right. And then uh, actually perform this test because I do know that Mrs. Knife Junkie would positively murder me if I dropped uh, <laughs> 450 bucks to do a torture test on two knives. So Right. Hmm. Okay. Well. Just a thought. Are, is anyone out it, there interested in this project it, or yeah. interested in the in the in the question? I mean, we can say, oh, well, obviously, the phosphor bronze washers are going to be more robust. But really, in practical terms, how does that really play out? That's what I'm interested in. And I definitely don't want to test it out on this because right. <laughs> it's my baby. But have to get another one for, yeah. for the testing purposes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a test knife only. Right. So exactly. that you keep your testing environment, you know, pure. That kind of exactly, thing. and then when it's done, I can't get rid of either one because think of all the time I spent with these knives. You know what I mean? So it's also baking in, well, ba- baking in the sentimental attachment. Just throwing this out: if you're serious about kicking off that Patreon, maybe you do have to get rid of both knives. Oh, to that's true. Maybe the highest funder uh, or the highest two funders of the Patreon for the test. I don't know. Maybe that's an idea. Gee, gosh, golly, that that sounds pretty generous, and and maybe actually well, the way to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll think about that. Just throwing that was off the fly. But anyway, <laughs> uh, something something to to think about. You did mention Ernest Emerson. Uh, in case folks uh, didn't listen to that, that was just a week or so ago, uh, episode number ninety four of the awesome. Knife Junkie podcast. Yeah, and I'm, it was I'm a, sorry to interview uh, to interrupt you, Jim, but whoa, what an interview! I love that. Yeah. It was such an awesome time. Yeah, it was a good interview. Good interview. All right, Bob. Uh, is, uh, we kind of, anything else uh, with uh, your state of the collection? Did we talk enough about the Iron Dragon before? <laughs> or do you want to talk about it again? I believe I believe we've discussed enough for for this sitting. We've discussed for, the Iron for Dragon this enough. episode. Maybe next week we can get a thumb update. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> a thumb update. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. 
Uh, okay, so uh, before we leave, and you were just talking about, we were just talking about Ernest Emerson, but I wanted to uh, talk about one thing that's kind of Ernest Emerson related, which is the Snaggletooth MF. Rob Penna uh, of Snaggletooth Tactical, uh, who invented this uh, awesome, who, who with his nephew, I should say, came up with this awesome um, aftermarket device that you can put on your uh, removable thumb stud knives that helps, uh, that pocket deploys the knife, much like an Emerson Wave. And it also gives you a, a, an additional thumb ramp, which is great on certain knives. I have, uh, I carry almost every day a, a pink cold steel broken skull, very thin knife in my waistband. And I have a Snaggletooth MF on it to uh, open it. Rob Penna knows all about my, uh, my love of this pink knife. And he sent me uh, a prototype of their new aluminum Snaggletooth MF pocket deployers. And uh, what an improvement. I love it. And and he sent it to me in, in pink. All right. So he's not only going to be making these in aluminum, brushed aluminum and natural aluminum, but he's going to be coating them. Uh, and the colors match the, the color range of the Broken Skull series perfectly. At least my pink one matches my pink Broken Skull perfectly. And uh, I'm a sucker for aluminum. Aluminum was what this thing needed. Now, don't get me wrong. The, the high the high impact plastic uh, GR, uh, GRN, I believe that they're using normally is great. It, n- there's no issue with it at all. Uh, it works perfectly, but just in terms of materials, I like aluminum is way up there. I think I almost like it more than titanium actually. Um, so to, to get this, I just wanted to, to give Rob a shout out and snaggle tooth MF. I love the product you're making. Uh, the, these pocket deployers are awesome. You've also sent me the, the cog rings, these are karambit like uh, pull rings that you can attach to your uh, Code 4 or your Recon 1. And uh, they, they sort of turn your, or they turn your Recon 1 and Code 4 into a, into a karambit. And uh, so they just make really cool products. I'm really glad they're making them. They're going to be making them out of aluminum. So keep your eye out. They also have another size, a smaller size. So you can put the, put the damn thing on your, um, on your bug out. Who doesn't need a pocket deploying bug out? I think it's awesome. Shout out to Rob and Snaggletooth Tactical. I think you're doing a great job. Right. Keep them coming. And you can find that online. I think it's what Snaggletooth is it SnaggletoothTactical.com? I believe it is. Uh, yeah, but I'm we not, will I... we will find that out and put it in the show notes. Yeah, and uh, just uh, uh, remind you that uh, again, Rob Penna was on the uh, Knife Junkie podcast uh, episode number twenty three. We had him on to. Uh, uh, to talk about some stuff, and then he was uh, the main featured interview on episode number 16 of the Knife Junkie podcast. So you can go to thenifejunkie.com slash 16 or thenifejunkie.com slash 23 and uh, hear those uh, interviews with Rob. And uh, Bob, also, I think I saw a video on the YouTube channel that you did about the, oh, yeah. uh, the Snaggletooth. Yep, I was out. Uh, I go out for a daily walk with my girls in the woods, and... Uh, my older daughter is an aspiring cinematographer. At least uh, it, it it's an excuse for her to get her hands on my cell phone, on my uh, iPhone. And so uh, we took a little movie out there in the woods, and I just wanted to show off. You know, the light, it was uh, overcast, so the light was perfect. And I wanted to show off the uh, the nice pink color. Uh, and as, as a proof of concept that I imagine all the other colors uh, are high fidelity to the handles, uh, the G10 handles of the, of the various knives. So, uh, right. yeah, it was fun. It was great. Check it yeah. out. Uh, all right. Well, that uh, that web address again for Snaggletooth Tactical is snaggletoothmf.com. Snaggletoothmf.com. So you can find uh, all of Rob's uh, products there. All right, Bob, as we uh, wrap up, I wanted to uh, kind of mention that we, uh, from time to time, take a look at uh, knife shows and knife events and our good friends at uh, KnifeMagazine.com have a great listing of the shows. If you go there now, you'll see canceled, postponed, postponed, canceled because of the coronavirus. So uh, if you have any uh, shows that you're thinking about going to, they're probably not happening. But you can find all the details, uh, again, at the KnifeMagazine.com slash events is where they have a great calendar of knife shows as well as uh, knife club meetings and those kind of things that you probably definitely want to check before you uh, make any travel because of the current situation. 
All right, that's uh, probably about going to do it for us on this issue uh, or this episode, number 97 of the Knife Junkie podcast, Bob. Uh, Final thoughts, man? Anything we haven't uh, said? Anything you want to kind of wrap up with? Well, I I feel like uh, my uh, just out of necessity, my uh, current thoughts about buying and selling on Blade forums are, you know, kind of stalling a little bit. Uh, So I've been actually having an interesting time unearthing uh, uh, old knives that I, I can't get rid of, but I never carry and actually carrying them. So maybe, uh, you know, it's a good opportunity to dust off old hobbies, to dust off uh, old knives, to uh, finally get to that stack of papers in the corner of the office. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Well, well, you've dusted off your knife making hobby because they're staying indeed. home more often. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, everybody stay safe and uh, we'll talk at you real soon. Episode number 97 in the books, as they say. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. Thank you so much for joining us on this midweek supplemental episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.